Sue Lord Roberts there. Well, today a petition was presented to the Home Office Minister Lynn Featherstone, signed by over 70,000 people, calling on the government to find and prosecute those responsible for mutilating women and girls in the UK. She joins us now, along with the former model and human rights campaigner Waris Deary, Baroness Ruth Rendell, the author and Labour peer, the French lawyer Linda Vaillant-Curiel, and Omar Ahmed from the Council of Somali Organisations. Also here are Dr Comfort Momo, the UK expert on FGM, and an audience of students involved with the charity Integrate Bristol, which <coughs> campaigns to prevent FGM in the UK. Um, Morris, first of all, uh, you had this done when you were five years old. I just wondered what effect that has had on you. What effect? Uh, I, I'm not quite understanding what effect. I well, mean, did it, it make changed your to life. Your life. Did yes, it? it changed your life for, for forever from that moment on. And uh, pff, nothing quite seemed the same. And uh, like that little girl just said, physically, mentally, sexually, kind of spiritually, you've been robbed. And uh, you just. You know, not only that, you, 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 a lot of complication and, and sickness comes with it. So you've health problems, uh, long-term health through, problems. All the way through, yes. What, where was the pressure to do it? I mean, you were a little girl. Was it a family thing or was it a... Yes, it was right in my, my mother's kind of lap, in, unfortunately to say. And uh, it was like you will hear it a million times. It was just a normal thing for... for for these people who's practicing, these families, and uh, you as a child, or trusting your own parents, mm. thinking whatever they're doing, they're doing right, or they're doing good, so you don't really know what's going on anyway. I've, I've heard that some people say, you know, my mother did it because she really loved me, and she thought it was a good thing, and the grandmother had it, and the great-grandmother, I mean, is that, is that true? It, it, is the, it is the truth fact. It's I, difficult just to believe so it here, though, isn't it? to say, yes, it is, and... and yeah, you can say, I mean, I can, I can ask you this, I can tell you this, like, I have a little daughter that I, 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 I adopted from Somalia that I wanted to save from her, from this mutilation just two years ago. And two days ago, I asked her how you feel about this whole, again, I explained, two years I, I teach her. And she looked at me and she said, I, I, would, have, I would have done without no fight. I would have to accept it. And so that, that's what's for the child. Omar, uh, is it the women within the Somali community who are demanding this rather than the men? Is, is there pressure for men to do it, fathers? I mean, historically there would have been an argument that uh, there was some historical um, um, support for that within the male community, but um, in the UK, certainly not. There's, this is almost entirely driven by women. There isn't demand and it's not supported by um, the male population. It's in fact, in many ways, condemned. It's condemned in the mosques. Because um, it's it's, it, there's no Quranic justification for it. It's none not, at it's all. It's not a Muslim thing. None at all. There, it, it's a cultural practice, and I think imams have been have, have been on TV and and in mosques and have stressed that point. Um, but there is no um, theological justification. But it is it is a cultural thing within the Somali community, even in Britain. Even though you say it's presumably completely abhorrent to you, is it? Not only is it completely abhorrent, I, I think it's important to get it into context. It's a extremely minute proportion of the Somali community that may still practice this in the you, United you, Kingdom. How do you know that? Because that's not, certainly not what we are hearing, and we, we'll go to the figures in a moment, but how do you know it's a minute proportion? Because people don't talk about it, it's, do they? It, This is a comparative thing. If we go back maybe um, 10, 15, 20 years ago, the prevalence of it was mu it was much more ripe. It was much more prevalent. But, but how what do I'm you trying know? to get across is, is that, that, that over a period of time, through education, um, that's actually reduced. The, the prevalence of it has reduced significantly. And that you know, when you say, "How do I know?" That, well, from being in the community, my contacts within the community, um, but also contacts within the health service, suggests that the prevalence is reducing significantly. Uh, let me come to Dr. Comfort Momo because you you treat people after this has happened. I just wondered what where the health consequences were, us talked a little bit about it, the, the sort of things that you see. Um, we see lots of women with complication, immediate complications such as hemorrhage that occurs, um, excessive bleeding. Um, what we see with the pregnant women that we see 
um, the present with infertility problems, which is related to infection over a period of time. They have inclusion cysts, which is like a demoid cyst, or they have recurrent urinary tract infection, as well as vaginal infection, um, period pain, and also, obviously, when they get married, to achieve penetration will take a long time. And they have the emotional and the psychological problems. So there's physical, emotional, psychological, sexual, yes. I mean, basically any... Now, I suppose you can't put a figure on it, but do you see more of it? Do you see a lot of it? What? I see more, and I disagree with um, Omar in the sense that um, we still see significant number of women and girls um, here in the UK. And at uh, my clinic, we see about 400 women and girls with FGM-related um, problems. To me, this is significant, and that's why we need to have a proper data. We need to do more research in terms of um, getting proper figures um, here in the UK. Let, let me ask those, who've, those of you who've helped us so much with our research here. I mean, uh, I wonder what pressures you feel some young women in your community feel from parents or others to have this done. Luna, you were very outspoken yesterday. Is, 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 do you hear about a lot of pressure to have this done? I mean, um, most girls that are born here will think, you know, whatever my parents, whatever they say is right. But um, I guess most of us have grown up with sort of this mentality now where we're thinking, well, actually, no, we're harming our own bodies and we shouldn't be doing that. And I think now parents are more understanding. I mean, they're, they're not in they don't have so much pressure under them compared to if they went back to Africa, for example, um, where they probably feel so much more pressure that they have to mutilate their girls. Here, they have far more, um, far more freedom, and they feel that here they can protect their girls easier. But saying that not enough is being done to protect these girls, for example, the government has no statistics. I mean, Omar over there says, you know, there's a minority that are practicing it, and Comfort Memo says, you know, she sees an increasing number of girls coming into her clinics. But there are no statistics, and this is where the health is, where the NHS is going wrong in this country. Is there anybody else who wants to come in on that? Yeah. What, what, do, what do you think? I mean, do you, do you hear a lot about this? Do people talk about it a lot more? No. Well, if you, do, if you had an FGM done, you wouldn't really want to talk about it because you feel like it's embarrassing. Everyone, you're not normal. You think, like, oh, that person's going to think I'm not normal anymore. So you keep it to yourself. You don't even tell anyone about it. And the doctors, they might not even know about it. They just be, they look for FGM type 3, not type 1. They don't think type 1 is that important. What, what does that mean, type 3? The much more serious type, complications, yeah, basically. It's much more serious where, op operation. Yeah, type 3 is where they get all of it done. But type 1 is more common, and type 2 as well. OK, anybody? Yeah. What you, what, anybody else from over here? Amina? Um, well, like, people, they, when they don't really talk about it, like especially when they have it done because they're, they're scared that the doctors or whoever they talk to about it, they don't really know what they're doing, so it's like they're losing faith in the NHS or if they talk to a teacher, like if they combine, if they confide in the teacher, they're losing confidence in the teacher because they don't know what they're talking about. But if the people were educated and know what types of FGM there are and also what it is and the complications and implications of having it done, uh, then they're more likely to come out and speak out about having the procedure done. But if people don't know about it, no one's going to talk about it because they're going to be like, OK, so this happened to me, no one else has had it done. Right, we'll come back to you. I know Muna wants to get in again, but uh, then Featherston, uh, I mean, why are there no statistics? Why does nobody collect figures on this? Well, firstly, let me say that this is uh, an abhorrent practice. It's an abusive practice. And while you say we turn a blind eye, actually, that's not the truth. As soon as we came into government, we published an action plan, a call to end violence against women and girls, which includes a whole section on FGM. And it is a, a huge issue. But, but you it, don't know how big. We it's don't huge, know exactly don't how, big. how big, but we are looking at how we may begin to get statistics. Um, data from the National Health Service has always been uh, an, an issue in, in the sense that if people come, 
um, there's an issue about if they think they're going to be reported or if anything is going to be done, then they may not present when they have complications. Ah, so it is cultural sensitivities, as we heard from some of our, our it's French It's not a cultural sensitivity, it's the need. The health service has always said, treat someone first. It's the same if you're attacked with a knife. It's taken years yeah, to begin to get this. Yeah, but if it's a paedophile, if it's a case of paedophilia, people have got a duty to well, look after the said, child. And this is I, abuse, isn't it? It's illegal. It's, it's absolutely illegal abuse. It's a safeguarding issue. But and they report paedophilia, but they wouldn't report this. Well, no, they should report it, absolutely. Absolutely, and the police uh, should take it seriously. They have a duty of safeguarding. Lo uh, local councils yeah, have a duty there, of safeguarding. There's not been a single prosecution, not Indeed. one prosecution um, since 1985. But I have to say, you know, that's over 25 years. We've been in government two years, and we are taking action, and we're moving forward. I mean, when you say there's not a single prosecution, you've heard from the girls and from others on the film how difficult it is to get people to come forward. Now, one of the but it would help if the authorities the feel that if they feel they're being taken seriously, if there isn't this cultural <coughs> sensitivity, and you do something about it. Well, uh, I am doing something about it, and I agree. I think there has been, in general, in the past, a, a over-cautious approach to, to reporting. And I'm holding a roundtable, actually, with the police and the health authorities in October right. to discuss this very part of this issue. Uh, Ruth Rendell, because you've, you've campaigned on this for a, lo a long time, I just wonder uh, how, how big a problem you think it is now and why we don't have these statistics, because we have statistics on all kinds of other things. Well, I have campaigned for about 12 years and I have made many speeches in the House of Lords, instituted many debates, asked questions. I've asked the government to set up a national register to record everybody who has um, seen FGM so that it can be noted. I have uh, suggested to them that all teachers should undergo a course so that they could um, spot children who were, to detect what is um, a child who is likely to be on a holiday, for instance, at this time of the year, to be taken out of this country to the Horn of Africa on a so-called holiday um, to stop it. I have um, um, alerted the government to how bad it is. Um, exactly they don't seem what, to be listening. Though, they don't or, seem or, to be listening. Lynn Featherson says they're listening now, but over well, the I years, don't know. 12 years, they haven't. I been. don't think they have listened. Well, in, in the well, well just a second then. I, well, why, I, why haven't they been listening? In what way? I wish I knew, because I have asked them. I've even had promises of, of, of setting up various um, committees and so on to look into it. And in all that time, I have never had any response of okay, uh, well, that kind. The minister's here. Well, in, in terms, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. The summer holidays are a very dangerous time. And last year, the police were at the airports intervening with families, with girls going to those countries. I've also, last week, had my officials in Africa talking to consuls from every consular place across Africa to give them the information, to give them the leaflets and the guidance that is practiced, to put it up so people who are coming from visa, for visas will have some information and know that it is illegal in this country. So we are taking Worse. action. What, what, what do you think of that? I, I, I really don't understand what, what, what's going on with the government and what, the, what they plan is, and, and the truth, plain truth is they don't give a damn. Okay, they don't ridiculous. care. Now it is. That I is was ridiculous. there 15 years ago in the House of Parliament, spoke about this, I wrote a book, there's some movies, there's nothing changed. Mm. So well, I don't know what you do. Well, so, 